One day I said to Raja Reddy, he was, used to drive Swami then, he's now a married man <laughs> with a, a, a son, and I saw him on the brand just now. And uh, I said to Raja, who spent most of his time meditating, I must say, on Horsley Hills, and I said, is it long since Swami did uh, the sand miracles that I've heard about? Uh, and Raja said, yes, it's a good while, a good while. Ah, oh, I said, I, I hope he does while we're here. Well, you only have to say a thing like that and go straight to Swami. I don't mean Raja really told him. He doesn't do that. He didn't do that sort of thing. But Swami picked it up himself, you see, that I wanted to see the sand miracles. And I, it's very educating, really, these sand miracles in the, in the, in, in the uh, business of miracles, you know. Uh, so anyway, I think it was the next evening or two evenings later, maybe, uh, he got us into different, he, I got, he put me in a jeep, Iris, and uh, Raja Reddy driving, and Swami sat in the same jeep. So very happy to be driving off with Swami in the evening night. And uh, then people came in another car, other people. And he took us to a spot where there was sand. It wasn't actually on a river uh, bank or anything. But the sand had been washed there somehow by the waters. And it's a great big patch of sand, you know, as much probably as half the size of the Darshan area, a spread of sand. A few trees around, and uh, we walked on the sand, and Swami stopped at one place and said uh, to some young men who were with us, and people came from other, other parts, of Horsley Hills, not just our party. They heard about what was happening and they came in cars. So there must have been about 40 people there, I suppose, men and women. And on a certain uh, area, it looked a very nice big flat sand area, Swami stopped and he said to the boys, oh, well, build up a platform here. So he immediately squashed any doubt I would have, any suspicion about having things already in the sand, you see, buried in the sand. Uh, when he said, and the boys got to work in front of me and all of us, and they, with their hands, they built a sand platform, maybe about 18 inches thick, and uh, two or three meters across. So, no, yes, about two or three meters in diameter. So Swami sat in the middle of this platform and we all sat around and I was pretty close and uh, but I, I wasn't touching the platform I was just probably a, a meter away from it or less half a meter because at one stage I went to put my hand on and he stopped me immediately. Don't, don't do that. I didn't know why for years, and I found out years later when Swami is doing these miracles, difficult ones in particular, he's, li he's like a, he becomes like a, a, a dynamo. He's charged with this power, this electric power. and. Uh, And if I had touched that sand that he was sitting on, it probably would have killed me. I know that from other things that happened later on. And uh, so he stopped me straight away. Then he started, I was close enough to see what he was doing. I must have been as, maybe as close as you are because he smoothed out the sand in front of him in the palm of his hand and he drew a little thing on it, you see, with his finger outline something. He said, what's that? 
I said, looks like a bowl to me, so I mean, yes, all right. Then, do you know what he did? He took sand from around with his hands and he built a little sand castle, as we called them as children, you know, on top of that drawing, on top of that sketch he'd made of the bowl. And uh, then, when he'd made this little mound, this little sand castle, as we called them as children, you must have done the same when we were on the beaches, uh, he, he, he smiled, he looked very happy. And I could feel tremendous power around in the atmosphere, as if the air was full of beings, angel, angelic beings. And uh, it, that feeling was there, Steen. Anyway, he just smiled, he laughed, and he put his fingers like this, you know, like this, just into the top of the sandcastle, and half an inch below the surface, he scratched the sand off, and there was a little silvery bowl made of the metal called Panchaloa which is a five metal alloy that they make the, uh, uh, make the idols of in the temples. And it's a, it's a wonderful alloy in that it never tarnishes. You know? Unlike silver, never tarnishes. And um, this little bowl, about maybe three or four inches high, about four inches high and round, with a screwed top. Screwed top in it. He took it out and he unscrewed the top and the perfume that came from it was just simply marvellous. And it was heavenly. It was, a, it was the nectar, you see. We call it amrit, but you know the amrit that comes from pictures and all that now? That's very weak compared with what was in that bowl. And he just had to open it for the air to be full of the perfume of this nectar of the gods and then he put it aside on the, on the sand beside him and he smoothed out the sand he made another little drawing and what's that he said to me so I was fairly close because he had asked me what he'd drawn you see but I didn't dare to put my hand on, on the platform on the sand platform what's that he said I said, yeah, it looks like a little spoon. Okay, he didn't say yes or no. He covered it again with sand, mound of sand, put his hand in it and drew out a little golden spoon. Then he stirred the liquid inside the bowl. And the bowl had, it was carved. It's like the first ring he gave me, which was made of pan shallow with carvings on it. And Swami went around giving a spoonful of this nectar to all the men. When he'd finished the men, he said, the ladies can wait till later. Because the ladies were mainly from those from, or from the circuit house where we were staying. And uh, so then he produced other things. Can't remember all of them, but then there's by the same method, you know, drawing something, flattening it out of the sand, drawing something, piling up the sand, and then bringing out of the sand photographs, japamalas, other things. And, but, you know, after a while, the atmosphere was, it was, it was heaven, it wasn't earth at all. Anyway, when we got, after he finished, you know, and everybody went home, and we went, he gave me this little bowl to carry. Uh, I carried it very carefully up in the Jeep as we drove up to Circuit House. It still had a bit of sand on its surface. And as soon as we got upstairs, he took it from me, and he went into the ladies' apartment, and I just went in too. And he gave them amrit. And then she came back and she said, we did even better. We had two spoonfuls each. So uh, I wondered then what had happened to it. And some years later, I met 
one of the Sayadevatis, and I don't remember his name, but he told me that he had visited Swami the following day, if it was ill, or two days later perhaps, and Swami had given him this bowl. And he said even then it was still full of amrit. So um, that to me was a very memorable thing because of the effects of the amrit and the taste of it and all the other aspects. Do you feel that heaven came down on earth when that happened? Well, it, it was that atmosphere. It really was. That feeling, I'm sure. I didn't see them, but I'm sure a clairvoyant could have seen a lot of great beings in the sky around. There were trees around the area where we were sitting on the sand. More things happened then. People always want to know about them. Because I was one of the fortunate ones who was there in his days of his lilas, you know, or his uh, miracles. He still performs them, but pretty well every time he gives an interview, he materializes something. He hasn't given away the materialization miracles at all, but he he was doing, he was concentrated then, you see. And he told me afterwards that he took me up there with the other people to give me material to write about. And I put all of this in Man of Miracles, that I'm telling you now and more. The impact it had on me, at be to begin with, was that I realized there was much more in nature than science had touched, see? Uh, and even that great scientist who is now dead, who was a follower of Swami, Dr. Bhagavantam, he said the same. He said he saw Swami doing things and saying, hey, that breaks the laws of chemistry and physics as I know them. But he said, I couldn't say, well, it doesn't exist. All I could say, well, Sai Baba creates a new law of nature. <laughs> uh, so, um, yes, well, that was the, uh, you see, I'll put it this way, Steen. During the course of uh, uh, during the course of, of uh, wisdom, ancient wisdom, before I met Swami, just before, uh, one of the lecturers who was president of the Theosophical Society was talking about. Uh, was talking about, uh, you know, in a general way that consciousness is the number one thing. And we know now, Swami tells us, God is being, consciousness, bliss, ananda. Three things. So you see, consciousness, we know, you and I know, that Consciousness came before physical matter. In fact, you could say consciousness, the consciousness of God creates this universe. Now, science was maintaining in my day that, but maybe you laugh at this, but this is what they were teaching when I was learning at high school and places, that consciousness comes from matter. See. Matter is first, consciousness comes out of matter. They had it quite the wrong way around. And uh, after this study at the uh, Theosophical Headquarters, I accepted the fact that consciousness is the mother of creation, the mother of matter. And that material, what we call matter, which is energy anyway, uh, comes from consciousness. And therefore, consciousness, divine consciousness, which you have potentially, and I have, we're all, we're all building up 
to, to this level of divine consciousness. That's what Swami is training us for, to get the divine consciousness so we have the same consci consciousness as He. And uh, if we did, we could do the same miracles, you see. Well, I wanted to see somebody who did that. And uh, lying on the beach, I'm going back now before the Hills Hills and before I saw Swami even, back to our day, the days 1965, before Swami came to Madras. And I was studying at the headquarters of Theosophical Society, this course they called the School of the Ancient Wisdom. And uh, in the afternoons when the lecture was over, we used to go and lie on the beach on the Bay of Bengal, and there was a, an Indian chap, his name I've forgotten, <clears throat> I used to lie there too and talk to me. And he it was who gave me a long list of ashrams he'd been to in India. And I had made a list of their addresses and so on because we intended to visit them, which we did later. And, uh, but he said, after he'd given me all the other, he said, there's another one. He said, it's very remote in a place called Puttaparty. He said, and I think you, he said, he didn't say I think, he said, you have to go by bullet cart. No roads. I haven't been there, he said, yet. And then he said, but they say he has phenomena. I knew in theosophical terms, phenomena meant supernormal phenomena or miracles. So I thought in my heart and mind then, I'm going to see him because maybe I'll have it demonstrated through him that consciousness commands matter. Man, God's consciousness, if you like. And to some degree, man's consciousness is above material things and can command them. And as a, an old miracle worker of ancient times said, to command nature, you must be above nature. That's where the Swami's spiritual teachings come in. If you rise completely above that, it's not, it, you're its master. It's not yours. You're the master of nature or the laws of nature. Then you can perform these same miracles. So that was... Some people go to Swami for all sorts of reasons, for health reasons, for this and that. I went primarily for a demonstration of that truth that consciousness commands matter. And I saw it the first time he went like this and produced the booty. See? Another thing I learned at the School of Wisdom was that the only, whereas the masters of the Great White Lodge and other great beings can, uh, to some degree, command nature and perform miracles. Some can't. Dear old Ramakrishna couldn't. I don't think Aurobindo could, but his were mainly moving out of the body and all that, traveling, uh, traveling around the world out of his body. But uh, it was taught also in this course that whereas you have great yogis, great adepts like the uh, masters, can perform a certain number of miracles for a certain time, but they mustn't overdo it or they lose the power. This is restored to us. And, and the teacher, who is the principal of the, uh, and the president of the Theosophical Society International, he made this statement. He said, the only being that can continue to perform supernormal, supernormal phenomena which we call miracles, is an avatar. And that is one, to my mind, that is one of the proofs of an avatar.